Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Desmond. Um, thank you, everyone who's out there joining the webinar. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, Liberia and all the activities we have going on there for uh, Eco Health Alliance and some of our partners in who are working in Liberia. Um, a little bit about myself. My name's uh, James Desmond. I'm a veterinarian. I've been working for Eco Health Alliance for almost 10 years now. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with EcoHealth, uh, it's a public health and conservation organization. Um, and a lot of what we do is um, focused on, I guess, under the umbrella of uh, One Health, which is sort of a, an idea, a concept about how, you know, all health and the different parts of the health sectors, whether it's the, an ecosystem or the environment or human health or animal health are all sort of interlinked. Um, and what we try and do in a lot of places is um, understand, try and better understand those links and how um, the different health sectors are, are linked together and how to improve health on a, on a global scale. Um, so if you look at this first slide here, um, what I'm gonna be mainly talking about is um, some of the emerging disease work we do there. Um, and also um, chimpanzees. My wife and I um, work with chimpanzees in Liberia. And, uh, and some of the issues um, related to uh, that are affecting the chimps um, negatively. And again, it all kind of falls under this one umbrella of One Health. So why don't I tell you a little bit about Liberia, for those of you who don't know where it is. Hold on a sec. Here we go. So um, Liberia is in West Africa. Um, you can see it right here it's number nine i'm not sure if you can see my cursor but the number nine um, liberia is about the size of virginia um, and as you can see it's re it's it's next to uh, cote d'ivoire uh, sierra leone and guinea um, and if you look closely at the map you can see there's a lot of green some light green and some dark green um, liberia is uh, Liberia, you can see there's a lot of dark green in Liberia, and it's a really important country for conservation because it's the last place in West Africa that still has large tracts of intact forest. Uh, so it's important for both conservation and also for what we do at EcoHealth, the focused on, on disease work, because as forest shrinks, one of the things we're concerned about and trying to understand better is how, you know, deforestation can affect um, disease emergence. If you look over here at, uh, at uh, Central Africa, this is sort of the Congo Basin. And so there's still a lot, a lot of forest left there. You can see how it's very dark. And over here in West Africa, um, it's the only place that has a lot of forest left. Now, the West Africa, the Ghanaian Highland Forest and West, the tropical forest in West Africa, you know, once spread all across this entire, this vast area. And right now, Liberia contains about 50% of the remaining forest. Um, and that's pretty tragic for all the animals that live there because a lot of the ecosystems have been destroyed. So for in, in Liberia, um, it's, there's you know, forest elephants, there's chimpanzees, there's pygmy hippos, there's pangolins, as well as a whole host of other animals that need to be protected. And by protecting the forest, we can better protect those species. So I'm gonna to jump to sort of specific, I'll, I'll first I'll start with talking about our work uh, in Liberia for Eco Health Alliance, which is focused on um, emerging disease. And we're funded, oops, sorry about that. That was a mistake. And now you're seeing my whole talk, unfortunately, or fortunately, you'll see what's coming. Um, so uh, the, the work we do in Liberia is funded uh, by USAID, and we have a consortium of organizations that uh, are working all around the world. There's about 28 countries in this project called PREDICT, and um, where we work in a number of countries around the world, and I'm the country coordinator for the work that goes on in, in Liberia. And what you see, this graphic you see here sort of summarizes what happens when there's a emerging disease event. So if you think about what happened in West Africa a few years ago in 2014 and 2015, there was a big Ebola outbreak and many, many people got sick. Um, and no one's really sure exactly yet where 
the Ebola, where that came from. So there's a lot of evidence that Ebola comes from bats, but it hasn't been identified specifically to be linked to bats. Uh, so what, that's one of the things we're trying to do. And if you look at this, let me see if I get my cursor here. If you look at uh, what happens in, with animal populations with emerging disease events. So Ebola is an example. Other things you hear about on the news like SARS or MERS or Zika virus or avian influenza. These diseases circulate in animal populations. And if you look at this little line at the bottom here, um, this gives you a sense of, you know, that it might be seasonal. There might be different reasons when, when these diseases are circulating. And if you think about human health, in the winter time, a lot of people get sick with the flu or they get colds. So that's a seasonal thing. So you might see, if you were to think of this line as humans, here, this would be the winter time at the top of the curve, and then this would be the summertime if we're only looking at colds. And the same thing happens with animals. There's a certain diseases that they get that circulate within their populations. And then sometimes a certain disease will, there'll be a spillover event where that disease jumps into an animal population. In this case, we have some domestic animals listed here and uh, depicted here. Animals can amplify a disease and then it can spill over to humans, or sometimes there's a direct spillover event into the human population. And we think that's what happened in West Africa with the Ebola outbreak. So the idea of what we're trying to do with the PREDICT project is sort of prevent these events from happening by better understanding what's happening in the wild populations. So if I go to the next slide, you can see what we're, our goal here is to our goal here is to understand what's happening in wild populations so we can better inform the decision makers in the public health sectors on how to uh, respond to certain threats, early detection. And then by doing that, we can be better prepared. So just take the example in West Africa. If we had had people monitoring the wild animal populations in the area and they had detected Ebola, maybe something could have been done. Maybe they would have been better prepared. The public health sector would have, the public health sector would have been better prepared knowing that Ebola was present in say, a, again, we're assuming a certain population of bats. Um, but if, the, if, if that was the case, then they could be better prepared. And then that maybe we could prevent these big outbreaks from happening where a lot of people got sick and a lot of people died. And the it's not only the benefits to you know these tragedies that happen with people and families and animals but it also becomes a big economic issue because you know the ebola outbreak in west africa cost is estimated costs are 40 to 50 billion dollars it costs a lot less money to do prevention than it than it does to you know respond to an outbreak after it's already jumped into the human population so that's the goal with what we're trying to do with PREDICT, and that's on a global scale. In Liberia specifically, we have a sub-project where we are looking specifically at Ebola. So let me step back a minute. PREDICT, is, PREDICT on a global scale, we're working in, as I mentioned, 28 countries around the world. Uh, we screen for a certain number of viral families, so about five different viruses. Um, but because of the Ebola outbreak that happened in West Africa, we're specifically looking at Ebola in Liberia. And we have our partners, uh, University of California at Davis, is also working in Sierra Leone and Guinea. And we're all trying to do uh, the same thing, which is identify the wildlife reservoir for Ebola. So we've picked a number of sites in each country. If you look at this map here, the orange areas, the lighter orange areas are from, from light to dark is where there were Ebola cases. So the darkest areas are where the most cases were, and the light areas where there were fewer cases. Um, so we've, what we try and do in these three countries is we coordinate together to work across the landscape, sampling in urban areas, in, in, uh, in forest areas, and then in rural areas to see if we can find any differences, first of all, to find the, the wildlife reservoir, but also to see if there's any differences between the animals living in those areas, if there might be a different, uh, different risk associated with, say, someone in a small village who lives near a pristine type forest or someone who lives in an area where there's 
a bit, a bit of degraded forest versus someone who lives in, in an urban setting. And we have very lofty goals for this project is to sample 54,000 animals over, over a three year period. And uh, you know, in the process of that, because this is USAID, for those of you who don't know, USAID is the US Agency for International Development. Um, it's, a, it's a combination of a research project and also a development project. So in Sierra Leone and Liberia and Guinea, we've been able to train many, many people, probably um, I would estimate around 50 to 60 uh, scientists, field technicians to go out and sample animals, uh, get good quality samples, sample the animals humanely, all the animals, animals that we catch, bats and rodents, uh, we capture them, we take uh, different types of biological samples, and then we release the animals unharmed. So we have really, really skilled people and it's been you know, a pleasure to work with them. And also it, it before the PREDICT project, uh, Equal Health Alliance and UC Davis came to these countries, there was, they didn't have the capacity to respond, especially in Liberia. So now there's a team in country that can respond. So if there's some, suppose there's some new Ebola outbreak or another disease that's unknown, uh, the, the PREDICT team will be able to go and investigate whether it's a zoonotic disease and sample the animals and get information rapidly and professionally and get some answers quickly, which was you know, something that didn't exist there before. Um, and here's a, just a picture. Um, I love this picture. It's a, it's a great example of how we work in the field. So you can see that we're working at night. So we're catching bats and everyone's in Tyvek suits. So we have full um, protective equipment, uh, which is super important. You know, obviously, as you know, um, these diseases are contagious. Ebola specifically is a very scary disease. So we want to make sure that uh, our number one priority when we're out working is to make sure that the, everyone's safe. So everyone's in Tyvek suits and respirators. And we have uh, over here, we have a, this is a negative 80 freezer, really cool piece of equipment um, that we take in the field with us so that we can maintain the cold chain. And then here you can see this area here, this bucket, it's a couple buckets. This is where people come out um, to disinfect. So they disrobe here out of their Tyvek suits and their, and their PPE. PPE stands for personal protective equipment. Um, and they um, disinfect. Uh, so anyone who's inside the tent has to be wearing the PPE. Otherwise, you're not allowed in. So we consider this like the hut zone. Um, and like I said, before, before we came there, people didn't do this. And that's actually one of the things that led to so many problems in West Africa. It's not just, you know, that West Africa is very poor. Liberia is one of the five poorest countries in the world. And so when the, when the Ebola outbreak happened, a lot of people didn't have the training to, um, to be able to respond. Even in the human health sector, respond appropriately. They didn't have the right equipment. They didn't have the right training. And that's one of the reasons why the disease spread so quickly in the, in the human population. So in addition to what we do with PREDICT, uh, which is primarily looking at uh, diseases in wild animals. EcoHealth is also, as I mentioned before, is one of the world leaders in, in One Health and um, trying to operationalize One Health activities, educate people on why looking at public health through a One Health approach or One Health prism is really important. Um, and USAID funded another portion of the, of, the, of the project where they established a One Health platform in Liberia, and it's actually a part of the government now, which is really exciting. And next week, actually, we have a team going, uh, myself, I'm returning to Liberia on Thursday, and we have a team coming next week to work with the government and, and implement some new um, ways to assess uh, One Health and kind of see where the gaps are to see how we can improve uh, One Health, uh, operationalizing One Health in Liberia. And you know it's really exciting for Liberia because since this is a sort of a new way of looking at health, um, they're sort of on the forefront of trying to trying this approach. They understand the importance after their experience with with um, with Ebola that it's that this having this aspect of health, looking at health this way, is 
really important. So we're excited about that. And we've also been involved with um, with rabies. So you know, just just a couple of weeks ago, we've been trying for several years. I was I've been on the uh, technical working group for uh, rabies in Liberia, and we've been trying to get uh, a positive, like a confirmed case. And with the help of the FAO and USAID, they've built up their their central veterinary lab, and they've been able to positively identify, I think, four cases of rabies, which were then confirmed at a at a, a reference lab in Europe, which is very exciting because it kind of puts Liberia on the map. There's a there's an organization called the Global Alliance for Rabies Control that is it has a goal of eliminating rabies globally by 2030 and so having a we've all known that liberia, liberia has rabies but having it confirmed is super important because it's going to help them get funding to help combat rabies in the country so this picture here is a picture of all the organizations that are working together on world rabies day which is september 28th and we vaccinated a couple hundred dogs in a couple different locations but we had from all the different health sectors in in Liberia, so the Ministry of Agriculture, um, the Ministry of Health, the EPA, the Forestry Development Authority, and then of course other partners like the CD, the American CDC, the WHO, um, FAO. Everyone worked together, including in the Predict team. We all worked together to vaccinate dogs. And for me, you know, I've been interested in rabies since I was in vet school, and uh, I think it's the perfect. I consider it like the flagship disease for One Health because it's a disease that can be, um, it's a terrible disease. It mostly kills kids, little kids who get bitten by dogs. It kills, if if a mammal gets rabies, then they're gonna, they're not gonna make it, they're gonna die. So, but the cool thing about it is that you can prevent it. So by having these, the main carrier for rabies is uh, our domestic dogs. So if you have comprehensive um, strategies and uh, vaccination plans for each country, you should be able to eliminate rabies. And so we just had a workshop. I, unfortunately, I wasn't there. Um, right before I left to come to the US, there was a workshop being held uh, with the American CDC and the Global Alliance for Rabies Control had presenters. It was put on by uh, the FAO, paid for it. And so they had a week long workshop on devising a national strategy for controlling rabies in Liberia. So it's super exciting. And again, this goes back to capacity building. You have to train people to be able to handle dogs, uh, handle them humanely, restrain them, and then again, give the vaccines. And so uh, because of the, because of USAID's work with the PREDICT team, you know, we were at the beginning of the project, we were sampling domestic animals. And so I was able to train the, the PREDICT team to, uh, handle dogs and so then when we had world rabies day our the predict team was you know a super important component of making it a successful day so i was very excited about that um because we have an excellent team now other things in in liberia that we're trying to do through eco health is you know it's not only ebola and rabies there's other diseases that are endemic in liberia um that are scary diseases one of those is loss of fever um, we're hope we're doing we're hoping to get some funding to do a, a project on loss of fever, and then also monkeypox, <clears throat> excuse me, was recently confirmed uh, last fall. So uh, we also want to better understand what's happening with monkeypox in Liberia. So we'll be applying for some funds there, um, and then among across all these different projects that we do that are disease related, one of the things we pay a lot of attention to is land use change and whether that affects the emergence of these diseases or does it affect the prevalence of these diseases whether it's in animals or whether it's in human beings as well and then again you know capacity building is huge you know liberia has a has a very troubled history and um you know they started there was a coup back in 1980 followed by civil war so for like a couple generations uh the the country has lost um there's been a lot of damage done to the country in terms of their the human resource capacity, not only in science, but in many fields. So uh, this is a way that we feel like we can help help Liberian scientists, train Liberian scientists so they can carry on with the work um, later. And just I'll point out at the bottom of the screen here, uh, 
this is the consortium of people who work on, on PREDICT. There's UC Davis, Wildlife Conservation Society, EcoHealth Alliance, Metabiota, and the Smithsonian Institution, all funded by USAID. And uh, it's been a pleasure to work with all those groups. So I'm going to switch now um, to uh, chimpanzee conservation. So uh, my wife and I actually ended up in Liberia. Uh, we've been working in, in great ape conservation for a number of years, uh, mainly working with sanctuaries. And we've started a chimpanzee sanctuary in, in Liberia. And that's really what brought us to Liberia. There was a crisis with a group of uh, chimpanzees that were formerly used in research, and they had been abandoned by the organization that had done the research on them. So they, they had started doing research on them in the 70s. It went on for a number of years. It started out as hepatitis vaccine research. Um, and then these poor chimps were, you know, they had a very difficult life. They were taken out of the wild and then researched on and then eventually put on these islands uh, nearby where we live, which is, um, in a sort of estuarine habitat. And this map here shows, you know, the, if you look at this, the slash lines here, the diagonal lines, that's the former range of chimpanzees. Um, for those of you who don't know, there's um, four subspecies of chimpanzees. There's the eastern chimpanzee, which is over in this area. There's the western chimpanzee, which is um, the subspecies we have in, in Liberia. There's the central chimpanzee, which is all in the Congo Basin here. And there's a very small subspecies in Nigeria, um, which people are still looking at. So um, you can see the former range, there was a lot more habitat for the chimps, unfortunately. And now we're down to the, to the purple area. Um, and in Liberia here, um, we've, there was a census done in 2012, and they estimated at the time there were about 7,000 uh, wild chimpanzees in Liberia. And so having that many chimpanzees combined with the, you know, these large tracts of forest that are still remaining, the only large tracts still remaining in West Africa, uh, it becomes a real focus for chimpanzee con conservation. Um, now, in addition to the normal threats that happen to all wild animals, which is you know basically habitat loss. You know, the number one thing you can do to protect any wild animal population is establishing protected areas. Um, but the the other biggest threat after that, the second the secondary biggest threat is hunting. And so in Liberia, all across West Africa, people eat bushmeat. Um, I don't we don't think they specifically target chimpanzees per se, but certainly when hunters are out there hunting. If they see a chimp, they will they will kill the chimp for meat, and then if they happen to have a a baby with them, then they will try and sell the baby as part of as part of as part of the pet trade. Um, and so, before we arrived in in Liberia, um, no one was really doing anything about you know stopping this from from happening. Um, so, in twenty at the end of twenty sixteen, the government passed a a law that strengthened um, the wildlife protection laws. <clears throat> and the government is really excited about doing something about it. And so once we established the sanctuary, we were able to help support the law enforcement efforts of, of the government. So a lot of people wonder, you know, I think a lot of people think about sanctuaries and they think, oh, it's just, you know, it's just animal welfare. It's just these people who, you know, love animals and want to protect animals or um, and they think, oh, but they just want to play with baby animals or whatever it is. And it's actually not what it is. I mean, the primary goal of a, of a sanctuary is, is animal welfare. So we're rescuing these, um, these chimpanzees that have been orphaned. Um, the only way you get a baby chimp out of the forest is by killing at least the mother, maybe other family members. And, but the, I think the more important thing that uh, that sanctuaries do is they provide they're very complementary to conservation. So they allow the government body that's in charge of enforcing the wildlife laws to actually enforce the laws. Like I said before we came, the, the Forestry Development Authority, which is the the government body in Liberia that 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 protects the wildlife and protects the forests, 
they wouldn't confiscate a chimp because they didn't have anywhere to put it. And so um, this is a, it, it's great for them. They feel like, okay, finally we can, we can do something about enforcing the law. The other thing that's important about sanctuaries is, you know, chimpanzees, for example, live for 50 to 60 years. So once, once we establish the infrastructure for the sanctuary, it's a place where people can go and learn about chimps. I can't tell you how many times we've had people come see the chimps and it completely changes their opinion of chimps. They see them and they immediately realize that they're, they're individuals that, you know, that are very similar to people and they realize that they're, they're important and need to be uh, respected. Uh, the other thing is public awareness. So education and public awareness kind of go together, but now that we have the sanctuary there, we can start raising awareness about why chimps are important, um, why they're important for the country and a number of, you know, it's not just the, what they provide to the ecosystem, but for, for Liberia specifically and other countries, it's important because it can provide benefits like ecotourism. Right now, because of Liberia's history, they don't really have much tourism going on. But because they have all this forest and they have this large population of chimps, it could be a place that people come, especially because it's the only place that has forest left in West Africa. Um, so by enforcing the law, by, by arresting people and getting people to stop killing wild, that's our goal. The long-term goal is to get people to stop killing wild chimps. So by having the sanctuary there, we allow um, the law enforcement to do their job. People stop killing the wild chimps. And then... The, the end goal is that the wild chimpanzees are protected. That's the, that's the you know, our highest long-term priority is to protect, protect the wild chimps. And then the additional benefits are, you know, we're employing a lot of people, we're providing jobs to people. Um, and, you know, people are excited about that. Like I said, it's a very poor country, so people are hungry to, to work. They really want to work. And so we can provide training to people. They can learn about uh, how to how to take care of animals, not just chimps, but other animals and veterinary medicine. So that's an important aspect of what what the sanctuary can provide as well. Um, so there's a there's another aspect of this that's important. It's not just that the chimps are being sold in country. There's actually an illegal pet trade that's global. Um, and apes, you can see at this map here. This was a study done by the a United Nations entity called GRASP, which is the Great Ape um, Survival Partnership. Uh, there's many, many partners involved, both NGOs and governments. Um, and you can see here, you know, all the chimps are coming from this area, but they get moved all over the world. And the main places that they get moved are to the Middle East. And then from there, they might get moved to um, the East, to China, or to Southeast Asia. And you know, if you see a baby chimpanzee, you know, on TV or something like that, they're really, really cute. And people think, oh, I would love to have a chimpanzee as a pet. The fact is they make, they make terrible pets. Um, once they get to be about, you know, a year and a half or two years, they're very difficult to handle. Um, but more than that, you know, they shouldn't be taken out of their natural environment. They should be able to, they should be allowed to live their life. Uh, with their families in the forest. So it's very traumatic for these little guys when they're when they're taken out of the forest. Someone's, you know, killed at least their mother, maybe other family members, and then they have a very rough life um, either in captivity or especially when they get shipped somewhere. A lot of times they don't make it, um, a lot of times. So, you know, what's happened is, like over in China, you know, China uh, has a lot of money these days and there's a lot of communities over there like just municipalities that want to build zoos and so one of the things you know they want to fill those zoos with animals so people will try and get them by by just buying them and they think they might be getting they, they might even think it's legal um so there needs to be education done not only locally where we are but you know globally people need to understand why it's not okay to take these animals out of their natural environment and then put them in captivity somewhere else in the world. And the, so it's not just about, it's not just about great apes. It's about um, wildlife trade in general. There's uh, wildlife trade is 
to global industry. I think it's the fourth largest illegal in, uh, industry in the in the world, and it's linked to it's linked to organized crime, um, and it can it has a has a major impact. So it's not only people who like like us who are interested in conservation and, and protecting animals. Uh, law enforcement agencies are interested because the people who are trafficking in, in wildlife parts and wild and wild animals um, are funding the trafficking and all kinds of other stuff. So drugs, human trafficking, money laundering, um, and those funds could go towards any number of things. So terrorism or militias, it's just the people, the people who are trafficking in wildlife, they don't care, they're traffickers. They don't really care that necessarily that it's wildlife, it's a way to make money. So people estimate this you know, illicit business to be about $19 billion annually on a global scale. Um, so I'll just finish up, I'll show you some pictures of our chimps. Um, since we arrived in July of 2015, uh, we've rescued 24 chimpanzees. And and like I said, all those chimps, you know, if we hadn't been there, they'd, they'd be in captivity or, or would have died by now. So um, we know at least we're helping these individuals, which is, you know, which is great. Um, where the, the Forestry Development Authority is helping to, they're getting better at doing confiscations and we're getting better at um, building capacity to start really enforcing the law better. I haven't made any arrests yet, but we're hoping to get there soon. This is Lucy. Um, this is when she first came in. She's a, at this point, she was six months old, we, we estimate. And now she's two and a half, so she's doing great. Um, I'll just show you a few pictures of sort of before and after of some of our chimps. Um, Gwei and Gwei and Portia, there are a couple of our first, Gwei was our, one of our first rescues and Portia not long after that. So you can see them here when they're in captivity, looking not very happy. And then here they are together. Um, they're good friends and you can see how healthy they look. You know, here they don't have much hair. They look scared and depressed. And here they're hanging out together. Um, and being with other chimps, which is super important because they're very social animals. Um, here's Sweet Pea. She was rescued uh, also, she was the first or second rescue. Um, she had a terrible life. She still has some sort of post-traumatic behaviors where she shakes back and forth because she was kept in this uh, enclosure for we're not even sure how long, um, but for too long. Um, and so here's another picture of, of Lucy. Lucy before, Lucy a couple of years ago now, almost. Um, Rudy, Rudy and Lucy uh, are almost like brother and sister. We rescued them near the same time. And Gola and uh, Gloria, you can see Gola was very tiny when she came. And uh, these guys are both now living with our, our large group of chimps. And so this picture, um, I think is a is a great is a great picture. This is Gola here. This is my wife Jenny, uh, and this guy his name's Austin. He's a ranger for the FDA, and Austin um, was working in the forest doing a patrol in Gola National Park, just recently established national park, and he found the hunter who had killed uh, Gola's mother, and he tried to arrest the guy. The guy ran away, but he rescued Gola. Gola was probably only a month maybe two months old at the time. And the guy somehow managed to keep her alive for a couple of weeks before he got her to us. And then about three months later, he came to visit and you can see Gola's greeting him. Um, and it's just a great example, I think of, you know, it's frontline conservation. This guy rescued this little baby um, who certainly would have died or had a terrible life. And for us, the chimps, you know, a lot of people think of chimpanzees or just animals in general of sort of uh, on a on a concert on a population level, but for us it's personal. You know, we know Gola. She's an individual, and she you know deserves a chance to uh, she deserves a chance to live out the rest of her life. And so, by rescuing Gola, she represents other chimps that we want to protect in the wild. Like we wish we had never met Gola, but now that we've met her. We want to make sure she has a good life. And so that's how we think of, you know, it's it you can make conservation personal. You can think about the individual and and think about why it's important to protect individuals, which will then help the population level. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone 
uh, for joining the webinar. This is my last slide. This is Winner, who we also rescued, and uh, all of our. I have to thank all of our uh, all of our partners, Eco Health Alliance, um, USAID for funding all the predict work, uh, the National Public Health Institute of Liberia, which helps us with a lot of work in Liberia and is also where we currently have the all the chimps are living right now. Um, the Forestry Development Authority, and then our international partners, Conservation International, Wild Chimpanzee Foundation, who work with us in Liberia, and then Veterinarians International, who um, they're helping fund some of our work there with the Chimpanzee Sanctuary. And uh, the Society for Constant Nature of Liberia is a great, um, great local organization in Liberia that's doing a ton of work. Uh, they're our implementing partner for the PREDICT project. And, um, oh, I forgot to list uh, the Jane Goodall Institute, who's also given us money. Um, but they're, uh, they're, they're, they've, they've helped fund some of our confiscation work there, which is great, and we hope to We've been working with them for a long time and hope to continue working with them into the future. So uh, if people have questions, I'll try and take questions uh, on here if anyone has them. And of course, all the people who work for us, uh, I keep see, this is why you shouldn't thank people because then you leave people out. So um, we have a great team who work with the chimpanzees and I have an awesome team who work, um, who work in, uh, who work on, on the PREDICT project. Like right now they're out in the field uh, collecting bats. So um, it's pretty awesome. So I have a question here. Uh, so someone is asking, will any of these individuals ever go back into the wild or is it too late for them? Um, well, every sanctuary ho holds out hope that they will be able to return uh, some of the some of the animals into the wild. So with our chimps, we're not sure. Certainly, right now, it wouldn't be safe to put them in the wild because people are still hunting in the forest there. Um, but you know, hopefully, over time, maybe five, ten years from now, if we if the forests are well protected, um, there might be an opportunity to, uh, to to do so. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature um, has guidelines set forth uh, if you're going to if you're gonna do a grade eight pre-introduction program, there's a lot of risks for both the chimps. Um, and one of the things, one of the important, really important things, and this relates back to the One Health uh, approach that we try and use, is that because the chimps that have come to us, that live with us now at the sanctuary, because they're, they live so closely with humans, they have caregivers who take care of them, um, you know, there's a risk they're gonna contract some of the diseases that, that we have. And so if we ever put them back into the wild, we wanna be sure that they don't have diseases that could be then transferred to any wild chimpanzee populations, because that would be you know, obviously a disaster. Um, so that's one, of the, that's one of the big concerns that we have. And so if we were ever were to get to that point where we could release them into the wild, we'd have to do you know, really uh, comprehensive screening um, of the chimps, their health and, and, and any disease risk that might be there. Um, and I have an, I hope that answers the question. I have another question here. Um, so do all of, so this person asked, do all of your rescue chimps come from Liberia or do you draw from the greater West African area or have partnerships with other countries? That's a really good question. There's actually a, um, so all of our chimps come from Liberia, as far as we know. Um, and the there are sanctuaries all across Africa. Uh, mostly in the range states of chimpanzees. Uh, there's an, actually an organization called the Pan-African Sanctuary Alliance that, um, that has about 22 member sanctuaries. And not all of them are, it's most of them focus on great apes, but there's some that are, you know, rescue other types of primates and other types of animals. Uh, but it's a really great organization and they've been around since 2000. And they work together, so there's a lot of, uh, information sharing, there's meetings every year where people can, you know, learn from each other on how to better take care of, of the chimps. There's a, so just so you know, there in, in West Africa, there's sanctuaries and there's a well-established sanctuary in Sierra Leone. There's another well-established sanctuary in, in um, Guinea. And there's our sanctuary that's sort of just starting in Liberia. And there's another one that's uh, also starting in Cote d'Ivoire. 
Um, so that's great. So that'll provide uh, opportunities in those countries for hopefully enforcing the law better um, and rescuing some of these chimps who, you know, deserve to have a better life than one in captivity um, or being sold, you know, overseas somewhere. Um, here's another question. Um, so this person is asking if there is uh, a PREDICT program in Nigeria, as particularly in the Cross River where they have gorillas and chimps. So Nigeria is not one of the PREDICT countries. Um, and I'm not aware, my guess is there are maybe other projects that are similar to PREDICT. Um, maybe not on, you know, PREDICT's a global scale type uh, project, but my guess is there's other projects that are working on you know different emerging disease related issues. Um, I do know that in Nigeria there are sanctuaries there. Uh, there's a there's a mandrill sanctuary um, called uh, Pandrillus or Drill Ranch, um, and there used to be a a monkey sanctuary called uh, Circapan. But I don't think there's anything specific to gorillas and chimps. And for those of you who don't know, the Cross River Gorilla is the most endangered um, uh, subspecies of, of gorilla. They only live in that tiny part of part of Nigeria. Um, so let me see if there's any questions here. Uh, this person is asking, how do you treat an animal that has PTSD? Are there any protocols or best practices case by case? That's a really good question. Um, so for the chimps, that come into our care, uh, we assess, we, what we do is, you know, they, they come in at, sometimes they come in really young, sometimes they come in a little bit older. We, we, um, we assess sort of what their needs are basically. So initially we assess their health status um, and try and address any immediate health needs. Um, but then one of the, what we feel like is, you know, a really important aspect of what we do is make sure that they that they are feeling psychologically healthy. Um, and we do that by providing 24 hour care uh, for any chimp that's pretty much under two years old. Um, once they get to be about two, they sort of, they mix in with the other group. But anyone that first comes in, we provide 20 hour care. And if they're really young, we, we keep, we keep, we keep them, uh, with a caregiver 24 hours a day until they're ready to integrate into the larger group. And we do that because if you think about chimpanzees in the wild, um, they're with their mother 24 hours a day. Most chimps stay with their mom until they're about five years old. And especially the first couple of years, they're almost always physically attached. They never really go more than a, a few feet away. Um, and they always have to be ready to move with the group. So they pay very close attention to what their mom is doing. And if the mom starts starts to move, they they cry quickly, or they just jump on the mom, or the mom grabs them and puts them on her back or in her front, depending on how old they are. So for for chimpanzees, it's very very important that they have um, physical contact. It's uh, it's even more important, I would say, than for for humans. You know, if you think of a human infant, um, humans can you know they sleep in a crib and they're and they're fine. But chimpanzees, if they're not physically connected with uh, a chimp or another human, um, they they really suffer emotionally, um, and I think that's the way that they're most like us. Really, is, is is emotionally. So we find that we think that's really important. We found that actually, actually this picture here, Winner, you know, Winner came. He was probably about two and a half or three when he came, and he had a really had a really rough time. He lived in a small cage, bamboo cage, in a village, and um, didn't have a very great life. And he was alone, and he's had probably the toughest time of all our chimps integrating into the group because he we couldn't keep him in the house and we thought it'd be better for him to be with chimps uh <clears throat> right away um and he's kind of struggled because he's you know left he has less confidence than the other guys and didn't get the care he needed when he was younger um let me see if there's more questions here. um Someone's asking if we have any uh, opportunities for veterinary students to help out. Um, not right now, uh, but we hope to in the future. So we're, uh, we're 
hopefully within the next year, we'll be able to build some facilities where we can start taking in volunteers. So that'll be our goal. Certainly that's something we'd like to do in the future so that uh, we can have people come over because we need the help, number one, but also we can have people come over and also help train uh, people in Liberia um, to take care of the chimps, but also other animals as well. Um, so here's another question. What are some of the precautions you take to protect against bi-directional disease transmission between chimps and sanctuary workers um, slash vets, such as vaccinations, PPE, or administrative controls? So this is a really good question. Um, we have a, uh, we have, uh, so anyone who comes from overseas that comes over, we have a quarantine period. Um, we, because we work so closely with the chimps, our caregivers are with them, you know, either 24 hours a day or all day. Um, we don't require them to wear masks or gloves or anything like that because we think it actually would hinder the relationship they have with the chimps. Um, and because they're with them on a daily basis, um, a lot of times the PPE and the mask really wouldn't make any difference. Um, certainly like a surgical mask isn't going to make any difference to someone who's with the chimps all the time. It doesn't really offer that much protection. Even a respirator um, that is, you know, specifically made to prevent uh, viruses wouldn't make that much of a difference because they get moist. It's very hot in Liberia. So um, we find that it's better just to have people, have people, you know, have really good hygiene. So everyone's always washing their hands. Um, and we deworm uh, both the, the chimpanzees and, the, and, the, and our staff and ourselves regularly. Um, and if anyone's sick, um, they're supposed to report to us and, uh, and then, you know, not come to work, basically. Um, and the truth is, we don't really have that many health problems with the chimps. And whether that's because of the chimps are really hardy and they're getting good nutrition. I mean, that's another aspect of it as well is providing good nutrition. Um, and, uh, and so we make sure that, um, you know, that, uh, you know, we provide vaccinations to our staff so that certain, certain diseases that could pose a risk that we're most concerned about, like measles or polio, um, we test them for TB. So there's certain things we do um, to try and to, to try and prevent there being uh, you know a serious problem with with diseases. Another question. Um, so this person's asking about uh, having a career in wildlife conservation, um, and you know any if do I have any advice uh, on where to start or how uh, how people can help? Um, so I think you know I think the best thing you can do is start getting involved. I mean, if you're, you know, there's always places, um, I'm not sure where, where you live, but uh, there's like for myself and my wife, we started, um, we were traveling around and we ended up volunteering at a, at a, what, a orangutan uh, rehabilitation center in Borneo. But when, you know, that was only for a couple of months to get experience when we were back in the US, we volunteered at a number of different um, wildlife rehab centers to get experience working with animals and knowing how to treat them and knowing what their needs are. So I think getting involved, it depends what you want to do. So there's all different aspects of working in wildlife conservation. There's people who do uh, like field research, there's people who do, you know, the kind of work that um, we do with the chimps that is sort of more hands-on. Um, there's people who do even like landscape level, um, landscape level studies of, you know, how to protect, uh, how to protect whole landscapes. Um, so there's all different, all, all different kinds of ways you can, you can get involved. And also, you know, some of the things that are needed in, in wildlife conservation are things that you wouldn't things things that you wouldn't think think about. So such as like fundraising or marketing or, or business experience. Um, so having a well rounded a well rounded background um, can can help you when if you were to start applying for jobs or, or internships because 
you know, in our experience, um, a lot of times there's a lot of people who, who want to work with animals. Um, but a lot of times what, what people who work with animals need is people who have other skill sets to help either the organization grow or just, you know, it takes more than just um, working directly with the animals or being a vet to be able to, or being a caregiver to be able to, um, you need much more than that to, to actually help the animals. So um, I would start by just like with in any, in any career, uh, the best thing you can do is start you know, reaching out to people and, and networking um, and, you know, looking for opportunities like the fact that you're getting in touch now is great and if uh you know through eco health you could probably get my email and i could provide more, more detailed advice um this question uh so this person is asking how did you become a wildlife vet what was your motivation um so uh i i just touched on it a minute ago my my wife and i we had just gotten married you saw jenny's picture um and the other and the other uh, right here. So this is my wife Jenny, um, and we were um, we were traveling around. We had um, saved some money. We went on this round the world trip, and um, we ended up through a very strange coincidence. We knew someone who was working at this uh, at this orangutan re rehabilitation center in Borneo, and once we we asked if we could volunteer, and uh, there was another vet there who was. Uh, was working there and she was you know helping these baby orangutans who had been orphaned because of you know their parents had been killed and the, the forest was disappearing and at the same time she was doing this really amazing research on zoonotic diseases and disease transfer between humans and great apes and i was just you know fascinated and jenny had been a um wanted to work with animals her whole life and um, <clears throat> I'd always loved animals and worked with animals in some capacity. Um, so for her, it was, you know, she knew she was going to love it. But for me, it was, uh, it was really, really unique. Before I was a vet, I was a, I was actually an analytical chemist. And so, um, uh, I love science and, uh, this was a way working on the, you know, infectious disease stuff was a way that I could be doing research and doing science, but also, you know, helping these individual animals, which, you know, feels great to be able to do to rescue in individual uh, lives. Oops, sorry. Okay, let's see if there's more questions. Um, so uh, this is, again, the person from Nigeria. I'm into wildlife research, specifically bat health work but he is also interested, interested in primate health. How do I get involved? So I would say, um, you know, the number one thing is, is really is, is networking. Um, it, I, I'm not sure if it's possible to get, um, maybe I can respond to people individually or provide an email. I'll have to ask about that, but um, maybe someone can give my email, but there's, I could help you maybe get in touch with some people in, in Nigeria who do work with primates and, and, and might need some help. So, um, and again, I don't know about uh, specific bat projects in Nigeria, but you know, Nigeria has a has a at least one vet school. I'm not I'm not sure. It's a, there's a has a you know it's a very big population, and so there's um, my guess is there's a lot of there's there's a lot of research going on in in Nigeria, though I've never worked there, so I'm not aware specifically, except for this this one sanctuary that I was talking about. So let's see if we can get you my um my uh, my email. Maybe I can provide it here. I'll just put my email here for people to see, and then you can write to me after, and I can try and help out. There we go. Um, here's another uh, question. Uh, you mentioned the One Health platform established in Liberia, which is now part of the government. Are there efforts to incorporate more health dimensions slash considerations into forest development and conservation <clears throat> within environmental policy in Liberia? Um, that's a really good question. And to be honest, I don't know, I don't know specifically the answer to that. Um, I think that the One Health platform is a really good start. Um, and like I said, you know, Liberia is really at the forefront. Uh, there's there's a few 
there's a few countries in the world who have a, a One Health, have established a One Health um, component, whether, and they, it, it can be done in different ways. Um, uh, people are starting to recognize the importance of this sort of approach to um, this sort of approach to, to health. And in, in Liberia, um, you know, I don't think, I think the One Health approach right now, I think it's the platform that's the only thing where people are specifically trying to link, you know, forestry and conservation and health. Um, but like I said, I, th I think it's a good first step. And kind of the work we do with PREDICT certainly does that. It's just not part of part of the government. Um, but I think doing projects like this, you know, we have, um, we're hoping to, <clears throat> um, we, so the the Liberia Chimpanzee Rescue and Protection, we are we already work very closely with Conservation International, um, but Eco Health Alliance through through the Predict Project is hoping to work with them um, on a on a larger like landscape level, um, so that way we can. Now that's not government, but it certainly will inform the government. You know, so like for example, with with Predict, the work that we do, we provide all our data to the government. You know, so they're informed. Um, they're involved. We've even trained government government employees um, in the Forestry Development Authority on on the work that we do. Um, so we hope to do more of that in the future, so that um, so that they can better take care of their own forests in in a more comprehensive way. I hope that answers the question. Um, I think I think that's all. Oh no, wait. Here we go. Um, I think that's everything. So, um, thank you to everyone, unless there's any other, uh, questions. Um, appreciate everyone attending the talk. I hope it was informative and, um, maybe, uh, if EcoHealth thinks I've done a decent job, um, you know, we can do, uh, I can do another, another one of these someday. So thank you everyone. And I guess I'll, I'll sign off. Okay. Bye.